wonderful or supernatural events are not so uncommon. Rather, they are irregular in their incidence. Thus, there may not be one marvel to speak of in a century, and then often enough comes a plentiful crop of them. Comets blaze in the sky, meteors fall in rain, and terrible cataclysms beset humanity. But the strange event which I shall relate came alone, unsupported. Here we have something very different, for a grown lady is changed straight away into a fox. There is no explaining that away by any natural philosophy. Mrs. Tebrick's maiden name was certainly Fox, and it is possible that such a miracle happening before, the family may have gained their name as a soubriquet on that account. They were an ancient family, and have had their seat at Tangley Hall time out of mind. It is also true that there was a half-tame fox once upon a time chained up at Tangley Hall, and I have heard many speculative wiseacres in the public houses turn that to great account, though they could not but admit that there was never one there in Miss Sylvia's time. Sylvia Fox was married in the year 1879 to Mr. Richard Tebrick, and went to live after their honeymoon at Rylands, near Stokoe, Oxfordshire. I have not been able to ascertain how they first became acquainted. Tangley Hall is over 30 miles from Stokoe and extremely remote. But however they became acquainted, the marriage was a happy one. The bride was in her 23rd year. It is perhaps worth noting that there was nothing at all foxy in her appearance. On the contrary, she was a more than ordinarily beautiful woman. Her eyes were of a clear hazel but exceptionally brilliant, her hair dark with a shade of red in it. In manner she was reserved and perfectly well-bred. She had been strictly brought up by a woman of excellent principles, owing to the circumstance that her parents had been dead many years. On one of the first days of the year of 1880, in the afternoon, husband and wife went for a walk in the copse on the hill above Rylands. They were still at this time like lovers in their behaviour and were always together. While they were walking, they heard a huntsman's horn in the distance. Mr. Tebrick quickened his pace so as to reach the edge of the copse where they might get a good view of the hounds. His wife hung back, and he, holding her hand, began almost to drag her. Before they gained the edge of the copse, she suddenly snatched her hand away from his and cried out so that he instantly turned his head. Where his wife had been the moment before was a very small fox of a very bright red. It looked at him beseechingly, and he saw at once that his wife was looking at him from the animal's eyes. You may well think that if Mr. Tebrick were aghast, and so maybe was his lady at finding herself in that shape, so they did nothing but stare at each other, he bewildered, she asking him with her eyes, What am I now become? Have pity on me, husband, for I am your wife. So that with his gazing on her, and knowing her well, yet asking himself, Can it be she? And her beseeching and seeming to tell him that it was she indeed, they came at last together, and he took her in his arms. She lay very close to him, nestling under his coat, and fell to licking his face. So they passed a good while, till at last the poor fox began weeping. At this Mr. Tebrick could not contain his own tears, but sat down on the ground and sobbed for a great while but between his sobs kissing her, quite as if she had been a woman, and not caring in his grief that he was kissing the fox on the muzzle. They sat thus until it was dusk, when he recollected himself, and thought that he must somehow hide her and bring her home. He waited until it was quite dark, and buttoned her inside his topcoat, nay, even in his passion tearing open his shirt that she would be closer to his heart, he brought her into the house with infinite precautions, yet not without the dogs scenting her, after which nothing could moderate their clamour. The next thing he thought of was to hide her from the servants. He carried her to the bedroom, and then went downstairs again. He had three servants living in the house, the cook, the parlour-maid, and his wife's old nurse. The groom lived out. Mr. Tebrick pitched upon the parlour-maid. Janet... Mrs. Tebrick and I have had some bad news, and Mrs. Tebrick was called away to London. We are shutting up the house, and I must give you and Mrs. Brandt a month's wages and ask you to leave tomorrow at seven o'clock. Please tell the others. 
and now bring my tea to my study on a tray. Janet said nothing, for she was a shy girl, but when she entered the kitchen, Mr. Tebrick heard many exclamations from the cook. When Janet came back with his tea, Mr. Tebrick took the tray upstairs. At first he thought the room was empty, and his vixen got away, for he could see no sign of her. But then he saw something stirring in the corner, and then, behold, she came forth dragging her dressing gown, into which she had somehow struggled. Sylvia, he called softly, what do you do there? And then in a moment he saw for himself what she would be at, and blamed himself heartily, because he had not guessed that his wife would not want to go naked, no, notwithstanding the shape she was in. Nothing would satisfy him then until he had clothed her suitably, bringing dresses from the wardrobe for her to choose. But as might have been expected, they were too big for her now. But at last he picked out a little dressing jacket that she was fond of wearing in the mornings. While he tied the ribbons, his poor lady thanked him with gentle looks. Then he propped her in an armchair with cushions, and they took tea together, she very delicately drinking from a saucer and taking bread and butter from his hands. All this showed him, or so he thought, that his wife was still herself, and he was much comforted, and began to fancy they could be happy enough if they could escape the world and live alone. From this too sanguine dream he was aroused by hearing the groom trying to quieten the dogs, for ever since he had come in with his vixen they had been barking and growling. He started up now, calling to the man that he would come down to the dogs himself and quieten them. Mr. Tebrick went downstairs, and taking his gun from the rack, loaded it and went into the yard. There was a bright moon, so that he could see the dogs as clearly as could be. He shot them, both dead. Then, leaving them as they were, chained up, he went indoors again and found the groom, gave him a month's wages in lieu of notice, and told him to bury the two dogs. But by all this going on, the servants were much troubled. Hearing the shots, his wife's old nurse, or nanny, ran up to the bedroom, and so opening the door, saw the poor fox dressed in my lady's little jacket. Old nanny knew her mistress instantly. Oh, my poor Miss Sylvia, what dreadful change is this? Then, seeing her mistress start, she cried out, But never fear, my darling, your old nanny knows you. It will all come right in the end. Then she hurried out, fearing to be found there by Mr. Tebrick, and who knows, perhaps shot like the dogs for knowing the secret. Mr. Tebrick had all this time gone about paying off his servants and shooting his dogs as if he were in a dream. Now he fortified himself with several glasses of whiskey and went to bed, taking his vixen in his arms, where he slept soundly. In the morning when he woke up, they had the place to themselves, for the servants had all left first thing. Janet and the cook to Oxford to find work, and Nanny going back to the cottage near Tangley where her son lived, who was the pigman there. So with that morning there began what was now to be their ordinary life together. He would get up when it was broad day and light the fire downstairs and cook the breakfast, then brush his wife, sponge her with a damp sponge, then brush her again in all this using scent very freely to hide somewhat her rank odour. When she was dressed, he carried her downstairs and they had their breakfast together, she sitting at the table with him. She was still fond of the same food that she'd been used to before her transformation, a lightly boiled egg or slice of ham, a slice of buttered toast with a little quince jam. What helped most to make living with her bearable for Mr. Tebrick was that she understood him perfectly, yes, every word he said. Frequently he conversed with her, telling her all his thoughts. Puss Puss, he would say, for calling her that had been a habit with him, Sweet Puss, though you are a fox, I would rather live with you than any woman. I love you. Then anyone seeing them would have sworn that they were lovers, so passionately did each look on the other. Mr. Tebrick had many little things which busied him in the house, getting his meals, setting the room straight, making the bed and so forth. 
His vixen was often beside herself with vexation to see him in his clumsy way doing what she could have done so much better had she been able. Then, forgetful of the decency and decorum which she had at first imposed upon herself never to run upon all fours, she followed him everywhere, and if he did anything wrong she showed him the way of it. This womanliness in her never failed to delight him, for it showed she was still his wife, buried, as it were, in the carcass of a beast, but with a woman's soul. As often happens in January, the weather, which had been damp and misty, improved, and there were several sunny days. With this fine spell, it was but natural that Mr. Tebrick should think of taking his vixen out of doors. This was something he had not yet done, and the idea filled him with alarm, but he resolved to take her, though with full precautions. That is, he left the house door open, so that in case of need she could beat a swift retreat, then took his gun under his arm, and lastly he had her well wrapped up in a little fur jacket, lest she should take cold. He would have carried her too, but she delicately disengaged herself from his arms, for already her first horror of being seen to go on all fours had worn off. Her joy at going into the garden was inexpressible. For some time, indeed, she was almost dancing with delight, running this way, then that, though keeping always close to him. They walked around the garden and down to the pond, where there were ornamental waterfowl, widgeon and mandarin ducks, and seeing these again gave her great pleasure. They had always been her favourites, and now she ran down before him to the water's edge. But her appearance threw the ducks into the utmost degree of consternation. Those on shore flew to the centre of the pond, and there they began such a quacking that Mr. Tebrick was nearly deafened. The vixen appeared, if anything, more pleased than ever when she saw in what a commotion she had set them, and began cutting a thousand pretty capers, frolicking about, chasing her own brush, dancing on her hind legs even. Though at first he called her to come back to him, Mr. Tebrick was overborne by her pleasure, and sat down, while she frisked around happier than he had seen her since the change. Presently she came further away from the pond, and he laid hold of her and said, Come, Sylvia, my dear, it is growing cold, and it is time we went indoors. She agreed with him, though she threw half a glance over her shoulder at the ducks, and they both walked soberly enough towards the house. When they got within doors, Mr. Tebrick picked her up and kissed her. Sylvia, what a light-hearted, childish creature you are. Your courage under misfortune shall be a lesson to me, but I cannot, I cannot bear to see it. Here the tears stood suddenly in his eyes, and he lay down upon the ottoman and wept, paying no heed to her, until presently he was aroused by her licking his ear. After tea, she led him to the drawing-room, for it seemed she would have him play to her on the pianoforte. She led him to it, nay, what is more, she would herself pick out the music. First it was a fugue of Handel's, then some of Mendelssohn's songs without words. They sat happily engrossed for an hour in the candlelight. Thus did she admirably comfort her husband when he was dispirited. Next morning when he awoke he was distressed when he found that she was not in the bed with him, but was lying curled up at the foot of it. During breakfast she hardly listened when he spoke, but sat staring at her pet dove which was hanging in its cage. Mr. Tebrick sat silently looking out of the window for some time, but when he turned back to the vixen he saw that she was still staring at the caged bird, and as he looked he saw her lick her chops. He took the bird into the next room. Then, acting suddenly on impulse, he opened the cage door and set it free, saying, Go, poor bird, fly from this wretched house while you still remember your mistress who fed you from her coral lips. Farewell. But, poor gentleman, his troubles were not over yet, and indeed one may say that he ran to meet them by his constant supposing that his lady should still be the same to a tittle in her behaviour now that she was changed into a fox. At luncheon Mr. Tebrick helped her to a wing of chicken, and leaving the room for a minute to fetch some water, found her at his return, on the table, crunching the very bones. Whenever his vixen's conduct went beyond that which he expected in his wife, he was, as it were, 
cut to the quick, and no kind of agony could be greater to him than to see her thus forget herself. He stood silent, dismayed, until she had finished her hideous crunching and had devoured every scrap. Then he spoke to her gently, stroking her fur. Sylvia, is it so hard for you? Try and remember the past, my darling. Surely this affliction will pass soon, as suddenly as it came, and it will all seem to us like an evil dream. Yet though she appeared perfectly sensible of his words and gave him sorrowful and penitent looks like her old self, that same afternoon, on taking her out, he had all the difficulty in the world in keeping her away from the ducks. There came to him then a thought that was very disagreeable to him, namely, that he dare not trust his wife alone with any bird, or she would kill it. The following day, taking her into the drawing-room so that he could play her some music, he found her after some time cowering away from him. When he spoke to her she licked his hand but remained shivering at his feet. On recollecting how ill the ears of a dog can bear with our music, and how this dislike might be even greater in a fox, he closed the piano, and taking her in his arms, left the room. He could not help marvelling, though, since it was but two days after she herself had led him there, and even picked out for him to play those pieces which were her favourites. That night she would not sleep with him, neither in the bed nor on it, so he was forced to let her curl herself up on the floor. But several times she woke him by trotting around the room and scratching at the door. In the morning she was still restless and was reluctant to let him wash and brush her and appeared to dislike being scented. Ordinarily she had taken the greatest pleasure imaginable in her toilet and Mr. Tebrick was utterly dejected. It was then that he resolved to put a project into execution that would show him, or so he thought, whether he had a wife or only a wild vixen in his house. After breakfast, he gathered a nosegay of snowdrops from the garden, and then going into the village of Stokoe, he bought a rabbit. When he got back, he called, Sylvia, I have bought some flowers for you. At this, she ran up very prettily, and never giving as much as one glance to the rabbit which hopped about, she began to thank him for the flowers. Mr. Tebrick, and this was all part of his plan, took a vase and went to find some water. He stopped away five minutes, listening intently, but never heard the rabbit squeak. When he returned, what a horrid shambles was spread before his eyes. Blood on the carpet, blood on the armchairs, and what was worse... Mrs. Tebrick tearing and growling over a piece of the skin and the legs. The poor gentleman was heartbroken and fell into a chair weeping and groaning. After he had been some little while employed in this dismal way, his vixen, who had by this time bolted down the rabbit skin, head, ears and all, came to him and putting her paws on his knees began licking his face. But he, seeing her jaw sprinkled with fresh blood, would have none of it. But though he beat her off several times, she still came back to him, imploring his forgiveness with sorrowful eyes. And at length, after cursing her and beating her off for upwards of half an hour, he admitted to himself that he still did care for her, and even loved her dearly in spite of it all. Oh, Sylvia, would that you had never done this. Does not this butchery disgust you? Have you forgotten what it is to be a woman? Meanwhile, with every word of his, she crawled a step nearer on her belly and at last climbed onto him. His words then seemed to take effect on her, and her eyes filled with tears, and she wept most penitently in his arms. The next morning he had more of a struggle than ever to wash and dress her. At last he achieved his object although to be sure this left him better pleased than her, for she regarded her silk jacket with disfavour. Still at breakfast she was well-mannered, though a trifle hasty with her food, and later he took her out for an airing in the garden. She made no pretense now of enjoying the first snowdrops or the view from the terrace. No, there was only one thing for her now, the ducks, and she was off to them before he could stop her. Luckily they were all swimming when she got there, for a stream on the far side was not frozen. When he got down to the pond, 
He begged her to come back, but she stayed frisking about, getting as near the ducks as she dared on the thin ice. Presently she turned on herself and began tearing off her clothes, and at last got off her little jacket. Then she ran hither and thither a stark naked vixen, and without giving a glance to her poor husband who stood silently on the bank until he was chilled through. At last Mr. Tebrick reflected how earlier she struggled against being dressed, and he thought perhaps he was too strict with her, and if he let her have her own way they could manage to be happy somehow together, even if she did eat off the floor. So he called out to her, Sylvia, come now, be good, you shan't wear any more clothes if you don't want to, and you needn't sit at table, I promise, but you must stay with me and not go out alone, for that is dangerous. If any dog came on you, he would kill you. Directly he had finished speaking, she came to him joyously, began fawning on him and prancing around him, so that in spite of his vexation with her and being cold, he could not help stroking her. Oh, Sylvia, are you not willful and cunning? But I shall not reproach you, and will stick to my side of the bargain, and you must stick to yours. The next morning, Mr. Tebrick did not require his vixen to sit up at the table, but gave her breakfast on a dish in the corner, where, to tell the truth, she ate it all up with great daintiness and propriety. After lunch he took her out, and she never so much as offered to go near the ducks, but running before him, led him on to take her a longer walk. He took her through the fields by the most unfrequented ways, being alarmed lest they should be seen by anyone, and though they startled two or three rabbits, she never attempted to go after them. When they got home and were going into the porch, they came face to face with an old woman. The vixen ran forward without any shyness to greet her. Then Mr. Tebrick recognised his wife's old nurse. What are you doing here, Mrs. Cork? Poor Miss Sylvia, I saw her, sir, before I left, and I've had no peace of mind. I couldn't sleep thinking about her, so I've come back to look after her, sir. And the old woman stooped down and took Mrs. Tebrick by the paw. Mr. Tebrick unlocked the door, and they went in. When Mrs. Cork saw the house, she exclaimed again and again the place was a pigsty. They couldn't live like that. A gentleman must have someone to look after him. She would do it. He could trust her with the secret. At that time Mr. Tebrick was heartily sick of his own management of the business, and the truth is he welcomed her. But we may conclude that Mrs. Tebrick was as sorry to see her old nanny as her husband was glad. She had been brought up strictly by the old woman when she was a child, and was now again in her power. The first morning Mrs. Cork made her mistress a new jacket cutting down the sleeves of a blue silk one. But though at first Mrs. Tebrick submitted passively, she waited for her nanny's back to be turned, to tear her pretty piece of handiwork into shreds. So it was, time after time, until Mrs. Cork would, I think, have tried punishing her, if she had not been afraid of her mistress's rows of white teeth, which she often showed her, then laughing afterwards as if to say it was only play. Not content with tearing off the dresses that were fitted on her, one day Sylvia slipped upstairs to her wardrobe and tore down all her old dresses and made havoc with them, not sparing her wedding dress either. She grew steadily wilder. It is certain that whatever hopes Mr. Tebrick had of Mrs. Cork affecting his wife for the better were disappointed, and he was sorry now to have the old woman on his hands. True, she could be useful enough to him doing the housework and cooking but still he was anxious, since his secret was in her keeping. If she went into the village and met with all her old cronies, there would certainly be inquiries about what was going on at Rylands. Mr. Tebrick determined that the best thing he could do was to remove. After turning the matter over in his mind, he decided that no place would be so good for his purpose as old Nanny's cottage. It was near Tangley, and his lady, having known the area from her childhood, would feel at home there, and also it was utterly remote. Nor did it mean imparting his secret to others, for there was only Mrs. Cork's son, a widower, who was stone deaf and of a slow disposition. To be sure, there was little Polly, Mrs. Cork's granddaughter, but she was too young to be a danger. He talked the thing over with Mrs. Cork, and it was settled. 
he decided to drive over with his own horse and the dog cart. The next morning they locked up the house and departed, having first secured Mrs. Tebrick in a large wicker hamper. This was for safety, for if a dog scented her and she were loose, she might be in danger of her life. Mr. Tebrick drove with the hamper beside him on the front seat and spoke to her gently very often. She was overcome by the excitement of the journey and kept poking her nose first through one crevice, then through another. It was a bitterly cold day, and when they had gone about fifteen miles, they drew up by the roadside for a rest. It was freezing hard, but Mr. Tebrick opened his precious hamper and let his wife out. She was quite beside herself with joy, running hither and thither, and he took this to mean that she was glad at making this journey and rejoiced with her. As for Mrs. Cork, she sat motionless on the back seat of the dog cart and did not speak a word. When they drove off again, the snow began to come down, and that in earnest, so that he began to be afraid that they would never cover the ground. Just after nightfall they arrived at the cottage. His vixen was tired by then, as well as he, and they slept together, he in the bed and she under it, very contentedly. The next morning, Mr. Tebrick looked about old Nanny's cottage and found the thing there that he most wanted, a little walled-in garden where his wife could run in freedom and yet be safe. After they had had breakfast, she was wild to go out into the snow. So they went out together, and he had never seen such a mad creature in all his life as his wife was then. She ran to and fro and round in circles, biting at the snow and rolling in it. He joined her in the frolic and began snowballing her until she was so wild that it was all he could do to bring her indoors for luncheon. In the afternoon he showed his wife to little Polly, who seemed a great deal afraid of the fox. Mr. Tebrick took up a book and let them get acquainted by themselves. Presently Polly began talking to the fox, and then brought her doll to show her, so that very soon they seemed very good playmates together. Watching the two gave Mr. Tebrick great delight, and he thought that there was something very motherly in his vixen. Three days after they came to the cottage, the weather changed, and they woke up one morning to find the snow gone and the sun shining. Mr. Tebrick let his vixen out into the garden after breakfast, and then went to write some letters. When he went out later, he could see no sign of her, and he ran around bewildered. At last he spied a mound of fresh earth by the garden wall, and running thither found a hole freshly dug. Reaching down into it, he felt the vixen's brush, and could hear her working away with her claws. He called to her, Sylvia, are you trying to escape from me? I am your husband, and if I keep you confined it is to protect you. There are dogs everywhere that would kill you. Come out, Sylvia, I love you. But Sylvia would not listen to him. He spoke then in a different way, asking her had she forgot the bargain that she made with him that she would not go out alone. But she heeded this neither, until presently he cursed her obstinacy and told her that if she would be a damned fox, she was welcome to it. He would dig her out, and if she struggled, put her in a bag. These words brought her forth instantly, and she looked at him with such astonishment as if she knew not what could have made him angry. This made the poor gentleman, so simple was he, repent his outburst and feel most ashamed. But for all that he filled the hole with great stones, so that she would find her work harder if she was tempted to begin it again. In the afternoon he let her into the garden again, but sent little Polly to keep her company. Presently, looking out, he saw that his vixen had climbed an old pear tree, and was looking over the wall, and was not so far from it that she might jump over it. Mr. Tebrick ran out into the garden, and when his wife saw him, it seemed she was startled. 
and made a spring at the wall, but missed and fell back heavily on the ground. When Mr. Tebrick got to her, he found her head was twisted under her, and the neck seemed to be broken. The shock was so great to him that for some time he just knelt beside her limp body. At length, he recognized that she was indeed dead, and he blasphemed horribly and called on God to strike him dead or give his wife back to him. All this while, little Polly had stood by, staring. Now, crying with fear, she opened the garden door and ran out. Mr. Tebrick got up and went into the house, leaving his dear fox lying where she had fallen. He stayed indoors only minutes, and then came out again with a razor in his hand, intending to cut his own throat, for he was out of his senses with grief. But his vixen was gone. The garden door was still open. He ran through it. It led to a courtyard, on the far side of which were the large wooden doors to the lane. Mr. Tebrick found his vixen leaping up at these doors. He ran up to her, but she shrank away from him. She bared her teeth, but he paid no heed, only picked her up in his arms and took her indoors. Yet all the while he could scarce believe his eyes to see her living. Indeed, it was some hours before this silly gentleman began to suspect the truth, which was that his vixen was only shamming death to run away directly she was able. Indeed, it is an old and time-honoured trick of the fox. But so thoroughly had Mr. Tebrick been deceived by her, that at first he was as much overcome with joy at his wife still being alive as he had been with grief at thinking her dead. He hugged her, thanking God a dozen times for her preservation. But his kissing and fondling her had very little effect now, for she did not answer him by licking or soft looks, but stayed huddled and sullen. Her bad temper continued all that day. When it was dinner time, she refused to eat. The next morning was the same. At breakfast he tempted her with a freshly killed young pullet. It hurt him to make this advance to her, for hitherto he had kept her on cooked meats, but the pain of seeing her refuse it was harder still for him to bear. Added to this was now an anxiety lest she should starve herself to death rather than stay with him any longer. All that morning he kept her close, but in the afternoon, after he had lopped the pear tree, he let her loose again in the garden. When he came out after half an hour, he saw a hole by the wall, and she buried all but her brush digging desperately. He ran up to the hole and went down on his knees and began pulling her out by her hind legs. As soon as he had drawn her forth, she whipped round and bit his hand, but let go instantly. They faced each other for a minute. Her ears lay flat on her head, her gums were bared in a silent snarl, and her beautiful teeth threatened to bite him again. The blood ran freely from his hand, but he never noticed it, for all his thoughts were for his wife. Why are you so savage now, Sylvia? he said quietly. If I stand between you and your freedom, it is because I love you. But Sylvia never stirred a muscle. You would not do this if you were not in anguish, poor beast. You want your freedom. I cannot keep you. Why, you have forgotten who I am. The tears then began running down Mr. Tebrick's cheeks. Go, go if you want to, he sobbed. But if you remember me, come back. I love you. Go, go but kiss me now. He leant forward and put his lips to her snarling fangs, but though she kept snarling, she did not bite him. Then he got up quickly and opened the little door to the paddock. She went through it like an arrow, and in a moment was gone from his sight. Then, suddenly finding himself alone, Mr. Tebrick came, as it were, to himself and ran after her, calling her by name, and so went over the paddock and into the wood, and threw it for about a mile, running almost blindly. By then it was dark, and realizing that she was gone beyond recovery, he walked slowly homewards, wearied and spent in spirit.
When he got back to the cottage, he found Mrs. Cork waiting for him. What have you done with Mrs. Tebrick, sir? I missed her. I have let her go. She has run away. You ought to be ashamed, sir, cried the old woman. Poor lady, is that the way for her husband to talk? But Mr. Tebrick was not listening. He went out of the room and up to bed, and lay down as he was, in his clothes, utterly exhausted. He had a restless night, and it was late when he woke up. As he lay, he heard the trotting of horses. Mr. Tebrick jumped up and ran to the window, and saw a gentleman in a pink coat riding at a walk down the lane. At this sight, he pulled on his boots in mad haste and ran out, meaning to say that they must not hunt because his wife had escaped and they might kill her. But fury took possession of him, so that he could only cry out, How dare you, you damned blackguard! And with a stick in his hand, he threw himself on the gentleman in the pink coat. The man, finding himself suddenly assaulted in so unexpected a fashion, clubbed his hunting crop and dealt Mr. Tebrick a blow on the temple so that he fell insensible. Another gentleman rode up at this moment, and they were civil enough to dismount and carry Mr. Tebrick into the cottage, where old Nanny told them Mr. Tebrick's wife had run away and she was a vixen, and that was why Mr. Tebrick had assaulted them. The two gentlemen could not help laughing at this as they left, telling each other that Mr. Tebrick, whoever he was, was certainly a madman, and the old woman seemed as mad as her master. When Mr. Tebrick came to himself, it was past noon, and his head was aching so painfully that he was confused about what had happened. He went out and began calling his wife, but was overcome with faintness, and lay down in the open for a while. By the time he got back to the cottage, he had taken chill and had to keep to his bed for three days after. All this time he had food put out for his vixen every night, but though rats came and ate of it, they were never any prince of a fox. Mr. Tebrick came to think it possible that his vixen would have gone back to Stokoe, so he harnessed his horse in the dog cart and drove over to Rylands, though he was still in a fever. After that, he lived always solitary keeping away from his fellow men. Every time there was a hunt in the neighbourhood, he set the gates wide open, and taking his gun, stood sentinel in the hope that his wife would run in if she were pressed by the hounds, and so he could save her. But only once a hunt came near, and when two foxhounds strayed onto his land, he shot them instantly. Mr. Tebrick grew more and more to be a true misanthrope, he denied admittance to anyone that came to visit him, and went out chiefly in the early mornings before people were about, in the hope of seeing his beloved fox. He had become so careless of his own comfort in every way that he seldom ate a proper meal, and though he had always been very particular in his person before, he now gave up washing himself for weeks at a stretch. His only thought now was the recovery of his vixen, and of this he dreamed continually. One morning early in May, when he was out in the little copse, he sat down for a while on a tree stump, and when he looked up, he saw a fox coming towards him over the ploughed field. It was carrying a hare. Mr. Tebrick stood up and called, Sylvia, Sylvia, is that you? But the fox made off like an arrow, and our gentleman saw that it was not his wife for whereas Mrs. Tebrick had been of a very bright red, this was a swarthier beast altogether, and a good deal larger. Indeed, I am crazy, Mr. Tebrick cried out. Here I am, taking every fox I see to be my wife. My neighbours call me a madman, and they are right. Oh, God, how foul a creature I have become. Recall me to my duty. Let me not become a beast likewise, but restore me and forgive me, O oh my Lord. With that, he burst into scalding tears and knelt down and prayed. When he rose up, he walked back feeling exceedingly weak, but with a contrite heart, and then washed himself thoroughly and changed his clothes. For several days after this, he lived very soberly, for his weakness continued, but every day he read the Bible and prayed earnestly. So determined was he to overcome his folly or passion. One day he was reading when he was startled by hearing a fox bark 
Yet so great was this new turn that he did not rush outside as he would have done before, but stayed reading. Afterwards he said to himself that it was only a wild fox and sent by the devil to mock him, and that madness lay that way if he should listen. But on the other hand he could not deny to himself that it might have been his wife, and that he ought to welcome the prodigal. He was thus tormented with doubts and fears all night. The next morning he woke with a start and heard a fox bark once more. At that he pulled on his clothes and ran out as fast as he could to the garden gate. He looked about him eagerly, but could see no fox. Then suddenly his vixen stepped out of the copse about thirty yards away. My dearest wife, oh, Sylvia, he called, you are come back. And at the sound of his voice he saw her tail wag. But then, though he called her again, she stepped into the copse once more. He ran after her, but not too fast, lest he should frighten her away. He followed her through the underwood up the side of the hill, then she disappeared behind some bracken. When he got there, he could see her nowhere, but looking around him found a fox's earth. He went down on his hands and knees, but could see nothing of his vixen, so he waited. Presently he heard a noise of something moving. Then something pushed itself into sight. It was a small, sooty, black beast, like a puppy. There came another behind it, then another, and so on, until there were five. Lastly came his vixen, pushing her litter towards him, and he saw that her eyes were shining with pride and happiness. Now for the first time, Mr. Tebrick thoroughly understood what had happened to his vixen, and how far apart they now were. Looking first at one cub, then another, and having them sprawling over his lap, he forgot himself, only watching the pretty scene and taking pleasure in it. Now and then he would stroke his vixen and kiss her, liberties which she freely allowed him. He marvelled more than ever now at her beauty, for her gentleness with the cubs, and the extreme delight she took in them, seemed to him then to make her more lovely than before. Thus lying amongst them, the time slipped away quite fast, and he was surprised when she gathered her cubs together and pushed them before her into the earth, then coming back to him very humanly bid him good-bye, and that she hoped she would see him again soon. So admirably did she express her meaning that Mr. Tebrick got up at once and went home. But when he was all alone, all the thoughts which had not troubled him when he was with her came swarming back to torment him. Was not his wife unfaithful to him? Had she not prostituted herself to a beast? Was he not jealous? And looking into his heart, he found that he was indeed jealous, yes, and angry too, that now he must share his vixen with wild foxes. By the evening, he had resolved never to see her again. But in the middle of the night he woke up with his head very clear and said to himself, Am I not a madman? Can my dignity allow my being jealous of a beast? A thousand times no. I can be happy in seeing my vixen, for I love her. But she does right to be happy according to the laws of her being. The next day or two he saw his vixen and cubs again and these visits gave him such an innocent pleasure that very soon his notions of jealousy, dignity, and so on were entirely forgotten. By and by, as the summer wore on, the cubs came to know him, and he them, so that he was able to tell them easily apart, and then he christened them. For this purpose he brought a little bowl of water, sprinkled them as if in baptism, and told them he was their godfather, and gave each of them a name, calling them Sorrel, Caspar, Selwyn, Esther, and Angelica. Thus Mr. Tebrick had a whole family now to occupy him. He understood, or so he fancied, what it was to be happy, surrounded every morning by playful and affectionate little creatures whom he loved tenderly, and sitting beside their mother, whose simple happiness was the source of his own. But one morning after he had toiled up the hillside to the earth, he found to his surprise that Sylvia and the cubs were not there. He called to them, but in vain. 
and so he laid himself down on the mossy bank beside the earth and waited. At last he must have dropped asleep, for he awoke suddenly with all his senses alert, and opening his eyes found a full-grown fox sitting, watching him. It was the dog fox he had seen before carrying a hare. Now the secret was out, and Mr. Tebrick could see his rival before him. Here was the real father of his godchildren. It seemed to him strange that they were thus linked. We would both of us give our lives for theirs, he said to himself. What pride this fellow must feel to have such a wife and such children taking after him. Then the vixen and the cubs appeared and surrounded the dog fox, and it was suddenly all too much for Mr. Tebrick. In spite of his philosophy, a pang of jealousy shot through him. He could see that Sylvia had been hunting with her cubs, and that her thoughts were not with him. Very soon she led her cubs into the earth. The dog fox had vanished, and Mr. Tebrick was alone again. He did not wait longer, but went home. Now was his peace of mind all gone. The happiness which he had flattered himself the night before he knew so well how to enjoy seemed now but a fool's paradise in which he had been living. A hundred times this poor gentleman cursed himself bitterly, or called his lady bitch. That night Mr. Tebrick, worn out and wearied by his loathed passion of jealousy, fell into an uneasy and tormented sleep. He dreamt that his wife was with him in her own proper shape, as she was before her transformation. Yet she was changed, too, for her face was swollen with crying, and she was confessing to him some crime which she had committed. But he did not catch the broken words, nor did he wish to hear them. At last he spoke, saying, I know they are not my children, but you are still my wife. They shall never be neglected. I will pay for their education. Then he began turning over names of schools in his mind. Eton would not do, nor Harrow, nor Winchester. But he could not tell why these schools would not do for these children of hers. And even when he woke, he was saying to himself that he must send them to a private academy, or even at the worst, engage a tutor. Why, yes, he said, getting out of bed, that is what it must be, a tutor. Though even then there will be a difficulty at first. At these words he wondered what difficulty there would be, and then recollected that they were not ordinary children. No, they were foxes, mere foxes. When poor Mr. Tebrick had remembered this, he burst into a flood of tears. The whole of that day, for he was not to go to the earth until evening, he went about sorrowfully, torn by true pity for his poor vixen and her children. At last, when the time came, Mr. Tebrick went again up to the earth, and by the starlight he could just make out the cubs skylarking in the shadows. Then he was happy, and laughed softly for joy, and presently his vixen, coming out to him, put her feet up on his shoulders as he sat on the ground, and licked him, and he kissed her back on the muzzle, and gathered her in his arms. All his jealousies and the horror of his dream were forgotten now, what if they were foxes? Mr. Tebrick found he could be happy with them. As the weather was hot, he stayed out there all the night, playing hide-and-seek with them in the dark, till, tired, he lay down and was soon asleep. He was woken soon after dawn by one of the cubs tugging at his shoelaces in play. That moment of wakening was very sweet to him. The freshness of the morning, the first beams of sun upon the treetops, delighted him. At that moment, all human customs and institutions seemed to him nothing but folly. For, said he, I would exchange all my life as a man for my happiness now. He made up his mind to pass all the time he could with his dear Sylvia, and therefore he began going out to them for more of the daytime, and then he would sleep the night in the woods. And so he passed several weeks only returning to his house occasionally to get himself a fresh provision of food. After a while, both his vixen and cubs got a new habit of roaming. 
Sometimes Mr. Tebrick missed them for hours together, or for whole days even, and not knowing where they might be, he was lonely and anxious. Yet his Sylvia was thoughtful for him too, and would often send one of the cubs to fetch him to a new lair. For now they were all perfectly accustomed to his presence, and had come to look on him as their natural companion. And although he was in many ways irksome to them by scaring rabbits, yet they always rejoiced to see him. Mr. Tebrick could now follow after them anywhere, and could go through a wood as silently as a deer. But what was most strange of all, he had got a way of going doubled up, often almost on all fours, with his hands touching the ground every now and then. Occasionally he scared rabbits to where the cubs lay ambushed, or climbed up and robbed pigeons' nests for the eggs that they loved. One evening he went to a cottager who had a row of skeps and bought one of them, just as it was after the man had smothered the bees. The foxes bit greedily into the heavily scented comb, their jaws drowned in the sticky flood of sweetness. For hours afterwards they were happily employed in licking themselves clean. That night he slept near their lair, but they left him and went hunting. In the morning when he woke he was numb with cold. A white mist hung over everything, and the wood smelt of autumn. Mr. Tebrick got up and stretched his cramped limbs, and then walked homewards. The summer was over, and he reflected that the cubs were fast growing up. He asked himself what would become of his vixen and her children. Before winter he must tempt them into the security of his garden, and fortify it against all the dangers that threatened them. That night he slept indoors, but in the morning he was woken by the sound of trotting horses. Could they be hunting so soon, he wondered. Presently he reassured himself that it could not be a hunt already. He heard no other sound till eleven o'clock, when suddenly there was a clamour of hounds giving tongue, and not far off either. At this Mr. Tebrick ran out of his house, distracted, and opened the gates of his garden. There was silence again. He was now like one helpless with fear. At last he forced himself to go indoors and drink some tea. While he was there, he fancied he heard the hounds again. It was but a faint ghostly echo of their music, yet when he ran out of the house, it was already close at hand in the copse. As he reached the gate, Mr. Tebrick saw his wife, Sylvia, coming towards him, but very tired with running, and just upon her the hounds. The horror of that sight pierced him, for ever afterwards he was haunted by those hounds, their eagerness, their desperate efforts to gain on her, their blind lust for her. Now he should have run back, but instead he cried out to her, and she ran straight through the open gate to him. What followed was all over in a flash, but was seen by many witnesses. His vixen had at once sprung into Mr. Tebrick's arms, and before he could turn back, the hounds were upon them and had pulled them down. Then, at that moment, there was a scream of despair heard by all the field that had come up, which they declared afterwards was more like a woman's voice than a man's. But yet there was no clear proof whether it was Mr. Tebrick or his wife who had suddenly regained her voice. When the huntsman got to them and had whipped off the hounds, Mr. Tebrick had been terribly mauled and was bleeding from twenty wounds. As for his vixen, she was dead though he was still clasping her body in his arms. Mr. Tebrick was carried into the house at once, and assistance sent for. For a long while his life was despaired of, but at last he rallied, and in the end he recovered his reason, and lived to be a great age. For that matter, he is still alive.